Ad Chats with Frank Palmer, the marketing, media, and communications talk show with Terry O'Reilly. Presented by LifeWorks. Thank you to all our sponsors. Well, Headshot viewers, you're in for a very special treat today. I'll be interviewing the very talented Mr. Terry O'Reilly. Hello, Terry, and welcome to NAB's Ad Chats. Well, hello, Frank. Great to be here. Yeah, well, thank you again. But uh, thank you for taking the time uh, talking to me about your very outstanding, diverse career. As you know, these interviews that we're doing, and I know you've watched a few of them, will be assisting people that need some help that... Uh, of course, that NABS has been providing for over all the years, uh, more so than ever before, because as you know, our industry has uh, has changed. And the one thing that you all should know is that you're the very first interview of the year 2022. Uh -huh. So thank you for being our very first guest. Pleasure. Yes. Terry, as you know, over the next 45 minutes or so, I know that our viewers will find some reasons or secrets on how you've been so successful. I mean, I actually, when I started doing some rich research on you, I figured that he must have wanted to be a police officer at some point in time like myself, because there were so many different areas that you were able to discover about people's interesting careers. So obviously you, what you've done for a living, you must enjoy it because you're so good at it. Well, uh, if you're talking about the research of the show, I love researching. I, I I don't find that uh, an onerous task at all, Frank. And if you look at the books behind me, yeah. those are all marketing books. I can't, even when we're on vacation, my I'll have a marketing book with me and my wife will say, don't you want to read something else on your vacation? And I, I always say to her, reading about marketing is as enjoyable to me as watching a movie. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Well, maybe some of the secrets uh, about your marketing uh, success will come out today. So maybe some of these secrets will help some people compete in the business whatever their business might be so but before i begin, begin with my questions i want to give out our viewers a little background about your unique, unique career and i know that having gone through it i won't be able to cover it all off but boy whatever whatever i start so does that work for you sure all right well many of you know him as the host of the cbc show a uh, top rated show called under the influence but before that, uh, Terry be uh, became that radio sensation. He was an award-winning writer at Canada's, one of Canada's number one top advertising agency. I did not know that you said 17 or 18 years now that this is, is 17 years now that you've been 17 on the 17 years, the radio show, yeah. And you also were the co-founder of Pirate Radio and Television with eight recording studios, is that correct? Yep. yep. In Toronto, New York? Yep. Uh, and over 1 million listeners each week turn into Under the Influence? That's true. Wow. Um, I understand that there's been also about 60 million downloads that have taken place. Well, our show was downloaded last year alone 7 million times. So over the years, we were an early podcaster, Frank. We are one of the pioneering podcasts out there. Yeah. So it's probably over 50 million by now, I would, I would assume, uh, conservatively. That's a, that's a lot of downloads. Lot I never of, thought about you actually being one of the first podcasters, but it's true. I mean, people yeah. are actually emulating what you have done over all these years. Well, I think we started podcasting in 2011. So it's been over a decade for us now. And there's also a lot of people that are making a living at doing this right now. Yep. We have a podcast network now, as a matter of fact, that grew up around our show. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Now, you're also the author of three or is it four books? Three books. Yeah, and I've been, I know that I've read one or two of them. I've also been uh, a new viewer uh, or listener of your podcast, and I found them very, very interesting. I'm interested in hearing more about the, the, what my, my, my best mistake is about people who made bad careers that ended up being in good fortune. What was that all about? Well, a lot of the stories that I tell on the radio show are about companies or people that faced insurmountable problems. And I always thought that was a fascinating aspect of life. So I wanted to dive deeper into that. So this book called My Best Mistake is about people who made a catastrophic career mistake. They made a decision. It ended up being catastrophic to them, but it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to them. So that's the theme of that book. 
Well, I think that uh, that's very interesting because I think some, some people have this internal instinct about maybe not taking the next step and going in the other direction. And it turns out to be something that they wouldn't have thought of, but something made them stop. I don't know what it is, but maybe we'll find out a little bit more about that talking about you here today. So yeah. in the next 45 minutes, we're going to find some secrets, but you've made your career starting as a copy chief for FM radio in Burlington, Ontario, where you found out how you could fall flat in your face after all the hard work preparing for what you'd done. Now, what was that about falling on your face? That was the first job I got, I had out of Ryerson, Frank. I, I, I finished university in 1981, right into a recession year. So it was very tough for young people to find a job. And I want my dream was to become a copywriter in a national advertising agency. I sent out over six, I sent out 60 resumes to agencies across the country, Newfoundland to BC. And I got back 61 rejection letters. That's a true story. One place rejected me twice. <laughs> and that's how little they wanted me. And the only place that I could find a job was at this small radio station in Burlington, Ontario. And uh, I, they hired me, which was amazing to me. I was all alone in there, Frank. So I didn't know how to run a department. I had never really written any commercials per se, even though I knew that's what I wanted to do. So it was baptism by fire because we had about 150 ongoing retail clients. I was the only writer, only producer, all alone, making tons of mistakes, <laughs> writing horrible commercials until I got the knack of it. And then I, this is the great serendipity, which is what you were referring to earlier, I think, Frank, mm -hmm. is I had no interest in radio. I had an interest in writing advertising, but not radio with a capital R. And don't I fall in love with the medium? <clears throat> don't I fall in love with the medium because of that job? Oh. You know, it's interesting because pretty much all the interviews that I've done, there's a similar story about people, how they got their start or the, 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 the trauma that they went through. I mean, Arlene Dickinson talked about having no money and living on credit cards before she got started. And look you know at what her my now. Time, I, let me tell you my full-time salary in 1981. So 12 hours a day, six days a week only writer. I, so I wrote all the commercials, Frank. I produced all the commercials. I usually voiced the commercials because there was nobody else there. And I wrote a, a Beatle, here's my Beatle memorabilia, a Beatle trivia show every night that would air on the same station for $8,500 a year full time. Well, my first job was working for KBOS TV at $500 a month. So I beat you there by a few thousand bucks. But you know, the interesting thing when you bring that up, my first job working for KBOS TV was painting cells for the Beatles. I saw that in your book. I love that. You know, actually he was painting the back of the cells. I know. Somebody, somebody would trace them out and you had a color thing to paint them. But then after that, you worked for a couple of travel advertising agencies like DDB or Shia Day and Campbell Eward. I mean, DDB, who did you work for in that? Just out of curiosity. Do you Alan remember? Kasmer. Alan Kasmer was the creative director. Oh, Okay. Yeah. yeah. And how long were you there? You know, my first big job was actually Campbell Ewald, where I was hired by Trevor Goodgall. He became mm. my mentor in the business. But I way. knew Trevor. Yeah. He went, we, he, went, we did. he went to work for Morris Safford. Yeah. That's right. He eventually did. Yep. I went to Campbell Ewald. It was my first big time job. Uh, then I went to DDB under Alan Kasmer. I was there for probably a year, maybe. And then I moved to. Shia, when Shia Day opened up in Toronto, uh, I was one of the first hires there in 1988, I think. And that was my last stop before I started my own company in 1990. Well, there's another story about Trevor Goodgall because he fired me, actually. He did? Yeah, I was uh, working with uh, Morris Saffer on, at that time. Uh, it was a, a SO gasoline account that we had across yes. Canada. And uh, uh you're on your way with Esso was the line right. we came up with. And we won that business uh, across Canada. And eventually Morris uh, had the uh, uh, the lead contract and we were a subcontractor. And I got invited out for dinner at one of the Toronto uh, restaurants and had the pleasure of having dinner with him and got fired over a bottle of wine. So uh, <laughs> I can remember it like, like it was yesterday. Good but day. but while you're working at those agencies, obviously you had worked for uh, – Labatt's and Molson and Pepsi and Goodyear and Tim Hortons and Nissan and the Hudson Bay. 
I, I think in one of our little stories we're going to talk about today is, uh, well, who did you like best to work on Molson's or, or <laughs> Labatt's? <laughs> That's an interesting story because you know every young writer dreams of getting their hands on a beer account. You're but, absolutely uh, right. right? Yeah. And there was that. And back in those days, Frank, as you know, <clears throat> beer advertising was spending a lot of money in this country. They were the predominant uh, you know, advertisers. So there was big budgets and it was pretty exciting. When I got there, it was kind of a different uh, world because it wasn't quite as exciting as I hoped. There was a lot of clients like a lot of approval processes going on there. And everybody wanted sociability in their advertising. So it, it kind of limited the thinking, like they had to have a group in every commercial. So it was, it was, once I got there, it was tough slogging as far as writing great ads goes. Yeah. Well, we had a great time doing Bud Light commercials over the years and uh, creating the Bud Light Institute, which we had one a lot of the of best fun ever. One we of the had best fun there. Well, also, you've won hundreds of national and international awards for writing and directing. Uh, you've worked with notable actors like Kiefer Sutherland and uh, Bob Newhart and Martin Short, a funny guy, Ellen DeGeneres, Drew Carey, and even Alex uh, Baldwin, who's uh, yep. got a little bit of issues going on right now. <laughs> yep. Uh, but you've served on uh, on various radio juries, uh, Cannes Festival, co-chair on marketing awards. I'll ju also judge the International Clio Awards in Miami, yeah. London International Awards. And I look at this uh, program here of, of, of a list here of, of all the different ones that you've been on and the best podcasts and uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, American Association, Lifetime Achievement Award Advertising Design Club, Lifetime Achievement Award Te Television Bureau, honorary degrees from McMaster University, Doctor uh, Honorary Doctor of Laws, Humber College, Advanced Learning, St. Mary's University. Uh, I'm out of breath. I mean, I can go on. Uh, School of Miami Hall of Fame, uh, Alumni Achievement Awards. Um, and of course, uh, your claim to fame, which I first came in touch with, was when you came out and spoke to a group of our advertising people, keynote speaker, and, and a very good one. I also find uh, your topics... Uh, are very interesting because you all this research that you apparently have. So you talked about this area, uh, and I totally feel this way with you about you have to have emotion in advertising. And I find today the lack of it, just the lack of advertising. And as, how to become a smart marketer was very interesting is uh, that you don't have to outspend them, just outsmart smart them. And so in order to get a little taste of Terry, I want to have a little two minute video here for our viewers to watch. Okay. I went to Ryerson for radio and television because I knew I wanted to be in the broadcast world, but I didn't know exactly where. So I just headed in that direction. But one morning, some ad guys came in and started talking about the world, the, the world of advertising and about creative selling ideas and strategies and working with clients. And I sat in the back of that class and I saw my future. There's always great new ideas. I'm always fascinated by what someone can come up with for a product that's been around for 50 or 60 years. Finding a new way to market that with a new idea, I find is, is endlessly fascinating. And I just love the puzzle of marketing. It's not easy to do. It's, it's uh, I always say I had hair when I started in this business. One day, a very seasoned creative director came out to one of my seminars, and at the end of the day, he said to me, I can't believe you give it all away. And I said to him, I have to tell you something, the more I give, the more I get. For years, I thought of it as proprietary. I would keep, as most, a lot of people do, I would keep all the insights I had to myself or to my, just express them within my company. And then when I started doing that seminar, I started giving away everything I knew. And that was singularly the greatest marketing idea our company ever had. Because my personal belief is, when a company goes the extra inch, it's almost more meaningful than going the extra mile. And by that, I mean the small little touches that a company can do for you while you're doing business with them or while you're in their store. A company that obsesses about customer service, that, that kicks it up a couple of notches, that always worries about it or looks for ways to go the extra inch, just the small little touches, make, it, make that company so unique and so unusual that you will be the company everybody wants to do business with. 
you want to humanize insurance because it looks technical and it looks complicated and it looks like it's something you don't want to buy. But if you can humanize it through your marketing, through how you present yourself you know, to your customers. I'm sure most people go in, they have a meeting, they decide on a policy and they go home. That, that transaction can be more interesting than that. So I say look for ways to make it interesting. Look for ways to make it meaningful. Look for ways to make it memorable. And uh, if you say there's no way to make an insurance policy purchase memorable, I, th I say to you, you're not thinking hard enough about it. Well, I know you made fiberglass uh, memorable, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, uh, I found that to be is uh, important today, what you just said, maybe even more important today, because what I, I mean, I'm in the business of uh, marketing and advertising, and there's very few companies out there that I remember about what they're doing on TV or radio that's really go out of their way to make me feel important. I, I don't know anybody that, you know, they, they want to sell me something, but they don't make me feel important. So where were you born? Sudbury, Ontario, nickel capital of the world. And um, what school did you attend or schools did you attend there? I uh, did my high school at Sudbury Secondary School. And what's interesting about that, Frank, is we, I mean, here I am in a small mining town growing up. And uh, at high school, so five years from grades nine to 13, we actually had a film and television studio and a film and television course. Wow. So <laughs> amazing. I mean, imagine that I have this full studio, all the equipment, and we get taught how to create television and film for five years before I even get to go to university to study radio, television and film at Ryerson. Just a unbelievably fortunate. Yeah. And uh, you have uh, three daughters. No. I have three grown daughters. Two of them are married and one is engaged. And I just had my first grandchild wow, congratulations. in December. Yeah. yeah, we're thrilled about that. Yeah, well, that's great. And, and any hobbies that you wanted to do that other than what you're currently doing? I mean, I paint a little bit, uh, you know, that takes my mind away from, from advertising. It just allows me to sort of get into it and not think about anything. Is there anything like you have in the way? Well, I am a Beatle memorabilia collector, so I, I love the Beatles. And there's a little secret of my radio show, uh, Frank, that every episode has one reference to the Beatles in it. So I've done 350 radio episodes. Every one of them has a little hidden reference to the Beatles in it. So that's my tip of the hat. You're, to you're, you're the guy that uh, you're the guy like likes to hide the coin on the ice in the hockey. So that's right. I'm yeah. exa that's exactly right. And yeah. I have a 1951 Chevrolet pickup truck that I that I I noodle with. So that's that's my other. Uh, do, do you uh, actually drive it around? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a car nut also. Uh, is there any part of your background that I might have missed that people would find interesting? I know that you say, I, I, do, I did read that maybe people don't know that you were an early, early actor at the age of four on a <laughs> children's show called Rumper Room. And I remember that, but I don't remember do you. you on, yeah, yeah I, was on, I was on Rumper Room at four years old. The interesting story about that was uh, one day after the, one of the episodes of that show, a director uh, walked up to my mom and said, can we, would you mind if Terry, if we use Terry in a commercial we're shooting in the next studio? And my mom said, sure. So they walked me over into this other studio, Frank, and they had, a. this is 1963. They had a little table set up, a loaf of bread and a sandwich on a plate. And it was for a local bakery. And there was an announcer standing beside me, a, a gentleman talking about the bakery. And they said to me, Terry, just eat the sandwich and smile. So I did that. And, and I, I think I, well, I know I ad libbed a line that I said, uh, out of nowhere, do I have to eat the crust, which is such a funny kid line, right, which the director loved, and he kept in the commercial, then that commercial aired in Northern Ontario for the next three or four years, which is an amazing thing to me, because I was four years old at the time. But when I was seven years old, I could still watch myself as a four year old on television, which is such a weird thing. But it may have planted this love or fascination with advertising somewhere in my psyche because that was such an exciting moment for me. Yeah, yeah. I always remember that one line, let Mikey eat it. You know, let Mikey yeah, eat it. Life Cereal, another yeah. DDB ad, right? Yeah, well, uh, you described that great advertising is smart, intelligent, humorous, or dramatic, something that respects people's intelligence. Uh, it's an idea business, and creativity is the business of everything. It, it, the best story wins. You talk about storytelling, the smartest, most effective marketers in the world to do it. I wonder today whether or not there's too many clients that 
want to put too much stuff in the advertising and tell what stories are all about. I mean, the simplest ads win. But how does, and I'm going to play the snowplow. How does this get to the snowplow? You know, the snowblower. But love that. You, you said in advertising, um, it only appeals to the head and it's about the information, the heart and the head. Yeah. And 20% is made by the head and 80% is made by the heart. And here's what you said in a video. And I'm going to play that now. One of the most powerful arrows in our quiver as marketers is emotion. When we make decisions as human beings, we make them 20% with our heads and 80% with our hearts. And I don't care what the decision is. People make decisions for emotional reasons. Just think of the typical decisions you make in a day in, in your life. The vast majority are not made for purely practical reasons. Yet, as I said, most advertising only appeals to the head. Most advertising is just information. You have to say something about your product in a way that people feel it in their gut. Because if they don't feel it, nothing will happen. But here's what you have to remember about using emotion in advertising. Emotions are meant to be felt, but never stated. Like the words, trust me. Trust is based on a very specific emotion, but those words should never be stated. And that's why soap operas love them so much. When someone in a soap opera says, trust me, Barbara, it really means, Barbara, I'm going to poison you and marry your sister. <laughs> Most emotional statements have become cliches in advertising. So emotion should surround and completely inform your marketing, but the emotion itself should never be blurted out. Emotions that are shouted or said too directly make people very suspicious. I love that whole episode because uh, <laughs> I saw you intensely watching it yourself because as I said earlier to you, Terry, very few commercials stand out. In fact, the ones that I hate, the uh, media buyers tend to play more often than they should. And I want to phone the client in some cases. I won't mention them and say, if you play that commercial one more time, I'm never going to shop your store again. Do you know how many emails I get from listeners, Frank, that say the same thing to me? Like I get those every week from listeners. So how did you get about doing that commercial for the nuns? <laughs> That's a great story. So uh, I got a phone call one day from a nun who said that she was a listener of the radio show. And she said, uh, I have a brand, we have a branding problem. And I said, that sounds very intriguing. I said, let's have a meeting. So a couple of days later, um, about, uh, I think three or four nuns walked into my office. Very, very smart ladies. They sat down. They said to me, uh, Terry, when you were young, could you spot a nun walking down the street? <laughs> and I said, yes. And they said, how would you know it was a nun? I said, well, because they had a black habit on. She goes, exactly. We no longer wear habits. So we've lost our identity in the world and people forget we're there. We need a market, an advertising campaign that lets people know we're still out there. And that if there's women that are feeling that calling, they know to contact us. So I just want to tell you what, what we did for them quickly, Frank. Um, <laughs> They had free transit advertising given to them in Sault Ste. Marie. They were based in Sault Ste. Marie. The bus company there had given them some free interior transit boards. So we, uh, it wasn't a radio job. It was actually a, a transit job, which was interesting. We created a board that just said, um, if you're looking for answers, you're looking in the right direction. And then we wanted to put it on the ceiling of the bus. Huh. Right. Yeah. So we called the, uh, the bus company in, in uh, Sault Ste. Marie <clears throat> and we said, do you ever put ads on the ceiling of your bus? And they said, we don't do that. I said, I know that, but is it theoretically possible to put an ad on the ceiling of the bus? They said, we don't do that. I said, I know you don't do that, but is it theoretically possible to do that? <clears throat> and they said, yes, but, and I said, I'm coming to have a meeting with you. So we went there, had a meeting with them and convinced them to put it on the ceiling of the bus. Very interesting. Well, that's kind of 
leading me in, into my other story about uh, vices. And uh, I want to play a little video here about vices. <laughs> Gluttony, greed, sloth, envy, pride, wrath. The seven deadly sins or an advertising brief for Molson Canadian. It's hard to tell. Branding Vice has a long history in my industry. I give you Don Draper. As he lit a lucky strike, he was pouring three fingers of bourbon over ice as he seduced his client's wife, all the while dreaming up some zippy new copy for a beer in his head. Yes, Donald was a multitasker. But the love of Vice goes back much further than the madmen of the 60s. Many of the mightiest advertising agencies that started in the early 20th century, the ones that still stand today, like Young and Rubicam and BBDO, were all founded by the sons of preachers, which I find most interesting. While those young men watched their fathers rail against the deadly sins with fire and brimstone, and saw a repentant congregation come back week after week for forgiveness, those boys saw a future in vice and built monolithic corporations. See, advertising stumbled onto its greatest insight back then. And the insight was this, everybody is really two people the person you are and the person you want to be. All marketing is squarely aimed at person number two. Explain person number two. It's about aspiration. So it's about the things that we all dream of that we don't have yet. And they can be frivolous things. You might want to have a beautiful car or a lovely home, but they could also be things like, I just want to have a home or I want to be able to provide for my family or I want to become a better person or I want to dress better or whatever it might be. It's just advertising is usually, not always, but usually aimed at, at an aspiration that you can achieve by buying that product. Not that it's going to change your life per se, but it's going to incrementally help your life. And I think one of the things that Bill Birnbach got so right which has been lost over the years is he really, he never said a product was going to change your life. He just really said he, he was able to create advertising that showed how that product fit into your life. And he used utter honesty by doing it, which I think is such a, an endearing thing. Yeah. You know, the Volkswagen was ugly and underpowered, but it got you there. <laughs> like it, that, 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 utter honesty in advertising about how it really fits in your life, that it will help you. It'll, it'll make your life incrementally better, I think is the best advertising. Cause it's, well, it's you're right. Well, this next uh, video uh, really speaks to that in a very big way. And it's about the British railways. So let's play that little spot here. There's a very famous story in my business about an advertising agency pitching the British Rail account. The British Rail clients were asked to come to the agency to hear the pitch at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. When the clients arrived at the agency, they were greeted by a messy, unkempt lobby that clearly hadn't been cleaned in weeks. There were newspapers strewn about, empty coffee cups. It was dirty. The receptionist was rude at worst and completely disinterested at best. And as they sat in the lobby, sitting there in that mess, they grew more and more uncomfortable. And worst of all, time was ticking by. 20 minutes went by, then 30 minutes, then 45 minutes of just sitting there in that dirty lobby, waiting, waiting. After 50, 50, after 50 full minutes, the British Rail clients were so furious and so outraged that they got up to leave. At that precise moment, the agency creative director appeared and said, gentlemen, you've just experienced what thousands of British Rail customers experience every day. Let's sit down and talk to see if we can't figure out a way to change that. 
That has got to be one of the biggest pitch gambles I have ever heard of in advertising. But guess what? They got the business. Why, in my opinion? They made the British Rail clients feel the problem, not just understand it. Wonderful story. Have you ever found yourself to be in that position? Of um... just... Well, it's kind of like no one would expect that to take place. I mean, I, I found myself in a similar position at one point in time in our advertising work. I didn't know where it was going to go. And all of a sudden it went in the right direction going back again, you know? Yeah. yeah. How, do you make, okay. how do you make a client understand that their product is no good? You, it's like saying, can I tell you your pizza is no good? I know. And if you just make better pizza, you'd sell more. You probably wouldn't even have to advertise. That's such a difficult conversation to have in our business, isn't it, Frank? To really, because you, a relationship between uh, an agency and a client is always tenuous. No. And you're afraid to be sometimes, you know, brutally honest with your clients. When in fact, that really is our job. It is that objectivity that we bring to the table that makes us valuable. And I think that, but still, I think that conversation is, is difficult to have. Yeah, I know that in you talk in some of your episodes about commercials that you thought really hit the mark, and they were the Apple '86 commercial, uh, the VW snowplow, Michelin tire, the baby was in the tire. I've got two of them here that I want to play, um, and let's just play two of those spots right now. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification. History, a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a contradictory force. Our communication of the force is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to death, and we will bury them with them. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. You really have to be careful out there. The road's full of surprises. Since I got Michelin's, I feel in control. Sure of myself and my car. Look, no tire can stop surprises. I know. But with Michelin's, you can be ready for them. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. You know, Terry, those uh, commercials and those other ones are over 30 years old. I know. And, and I remember those commercials like they were today. I know. I know. And, and uh, the snowplow. Uh, and even... A Coca-Cola commercial that went way back, like to sing the world, uh, you know, uh, it actually had uh, uh, com that commercial really spoke of uh, ethnic at that time. Maybe they were ahead yeah. of their time. Yeah. But I'm just curious. You, I, I personally believe that commercials way back when are actually somewhat better than they are today. I don't know whether why. Yeah, I, I, I would I would agree with that, and that's why you hear so many of them in my radio show. I do, I do love ad history for starters, but I do think that there was a, there was more of a single-minded uh, purpose to advertising back then. As you said earlier, a lot of clients want to stuff, you know, 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag, and it always ends up with, you know, being terrible advertising. But I, I love the, the humor. I love the single-mindedness of those old ads, Frank. I mean, even that Apple ad, which, you know, as you know, revolutionized our business because we had never really seen an ad that had <clears throat> Hollywood scale to it before. <clears throat> and, you know, that ad, talk about strategy, that ad forever positioned Apple as the, as the giant slayer that it, you know, it was saying, we want to take the power of computers out of IBM and give it into the hands of the individual. 
And that commercial really, for all time, gave Apple a platform, which they still follow to this day. Because right. if you watch any Apple commercial, it's one person achieving something. Right. I right. love that. And, and as far as the Michelin ad goes, I didn't really love the commercial, but I love the, the line. Because so much is riding on your tires, I think is probably the best tagline in that category for all time. Yeah, yeah. You got a great line like that. You keep it for a long time. You and they threw it away. And I just like some, some, that's because he probably got a new ad agency who said he needed a new. Yeah. Very few ad agencies come in and say, we love your ad past advertising. Otherwise, they probably would lose their. Well, we might as well go I back know. to our own one. So when you're when you are out there choosing your guests or topics, is it getting more difficult now? No. Uh, for one thing, I don't do interviews on my show, Frank. I, I never do. It's all narration. It's all okay. me. So I never have to find interviewees. But no, the episode themes are the easiest part of the show because our industry is so dynamic. There's so many things happening at any given time. And I look around the world, not just into North America. So coming up with themes is, is the easiest part. Also, our listeners send, send me great episode theme ideas all the really? time. Oh. We have a, if you watch our social media, if you look at Under the Influence on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, we are having a constant conversation with our listeners. And they give me fantastic ideas. Yeah, because your advertising ranges from key marketing issues to emotional in advertising, customer service, yeah. changing ne negative perception, why outsmart your competitor by not spending as much. It's just, yeah. uh, I, I really like that thinking. And I just don't think a lot of advertising, I think almost afraid to say what their advertising should be. I mean, at my stage in career in life, I'm not worried about getting fired as much as I used to be. Maybe that's right. because I feel more comfortable in what I'm saying, but I want to tell you what's wrong. I didn't come to a doctor to tell him. I want him to tell me what's wrong with right. me. I don't want to go there and say, here's what I think's wrong. Please tell me the truth. You know, I, I couldn't agree with that more, Frank. I think, I think one of the biggest things that's missing from advertising right now is that kind of courage in the boardroom. And it takes, it's hard to do that. <clears throat> it's hard to have that kind of courage where it might get a little heated in the boardroom, but it's not to be uh, rude in the boardroom. It's to stand your ground. It's to, it's to fight for great ideas. Yeah. I think, I think that is always, I've always been willing to do that. There's no doubt about it. I, I learned early from Trevor. Trevor Goodgall was great in the boardroom. Uh, so much of, of our business, Frank, happens in the boardroom. And I think a lot of great ideas die in the boardroom. So you really have to become a great presenter in our business. And you're never really taught how to do that. You kind of have to watch great presenters at work and, and, and absorb by osmosis or watch a lot of bad presentations in boardrooms and learn that way. Because uh, it all comes down to, you know, the two sides of the coin, generating the ideas and selling the ideas. And I, I, I agree hundred percent. I, I watched the room in presentations, usually, I get the role of either starting the presentation or ending the presentation. Yep. This doesn't happen today as much as it used to. But then when the presentation is taking place, I watch everybody and I watch their movements. And I, and normally, whoever's running the presentation from the client side, everybody is nodding towards that person. And Paul Lavaugh used to have a, never made a presentation with any more than four people to get into a taxi. Yep. And far too often presentations are made today with too many people in the room who think they have a decision. And usually one person makes that decision at the end of the day. And maybe one of the interviews that you did, which I'm gonna play right now, a little smart part of it was with the very smart ad woman called Mary Wells. Let's just listen to this little part here. Advertisers were incredibly conservative and advertising agencies mirrored that safe, cautious mindset. But there was one advertising agency bucking that trend. It was turning the advertising industry upside down with the force of its creativity. That agency was Doyle Dane Burnback. Founder Bill Burnback was leading a creative revolution on Madison Avenue. He demanded that advertising be honest with bolder language and smarter ideas created with wit and stylish design. That philosophy generated big results for his clients. Mary Wells was fascinated by Burnback. 
She knew the ad she was forced to write at McCann Erickson would never get her hired at Doyle Dane. That was very interesting, I thought, mm. listening to that, you know, because yep. of your story about, you know. Um, one other one here I found was quite interesting, and we're getting close to the end because we're aiming, but there's so many more stories. You played this uh, Twitter on your Twitter account about a spokesperson changing brands. Hi, it's Terry O'Reilly. This week, we explore what happens when a spokesperson switches brands and starts pitching for a competitor. It's always jarring when an established spokesperson shows up in another campaign. Sometimes spokespeople get fired, and sometimes their competitors pick up those spokespeople and have a little fun with them. We'll tell the story of how the Verizon Can You Hear Me Now guy ended up pitching Sprint. How the most interesting man in the world went from Dos to a tequila. How the Peloton lady was saved by Ryan Reynolds and a little gin. And how a spokesperson for a hamburger chain got fired when she pitched spaghetti sauce. That's this week on Under the Influence. Hope you'll join us. I'm not sure if I can believe a spokesperson who changes brands too often. Um, and I've seen it happen over the years, but that's how they make their living too, you know? Yeah, I mean, they are actors too. I mean, the the, the Wendy's one is such an interesting story because when that little old lady, Clara Peller, said, where's the beef for Wendy's? It became, as you remember, a phenomenon as far as pop culture goes. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, she did a spaghetti uh, ad for spaghetti sauce and where she said, I found it. I found the beef. And <laughs> Wendy's fired her for that. So I mean, oh. it, that's the, the uh, you know, the world that actors live in. It's a, they can be, you know, celebrated, make a lot of money, then suddenly fired <laughs> in a minute, in a minute. Well, you know yourself that when you talk about Pepsi and Coke and you talk about Molson's and Labatt's and the number of cars accounts that the clients are so loyal to each other. I remember uh, in a presentation that uh, one of the uh, particular society was making to Coca-Cola. And I got to the boardroom before the presentation took place by about a half an hour. And I looked around the room and I said to the president of the organization, do you see anything wrong here? And he says, no, I got the, everything's fine. I got the, the I got the, the pop and the juices and the, a few buns and everything. I said, who are we pitching today? And he said, Coca-Cola. I said, well, why you better get rid of the Pepsi? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and he couldn't. I said, these guys, you're, you, they don't like each other, you know? No, it's it's warfare. Even in our studios, Frank, if we had Coke in our studios, we had to take all the Pepsi out of our fridge in the kitchen that day. Yeah. Like it, it wasn't, it was no laughing matter, right? Well, we were shooting a McDonald's commercial one day and uh, I got there early and, uh, and they, they, you know, they, they had uh, roast beef and everything else being served. And I go, the president of McDonald's is going to be here pretty quick. I said, you better get some McDonald's quarter pounders in here and get this stuff out of here. Now, you don't understand. Right. Like when I took George Cohen, I took the president of a bank to McDonald's to meet George Cohen. And when we got there, he says, let's go for lunch. And guess where we went? McDonald's. The chairman of the bank could not believe that he didn't take him to a fancy restaurant. Took him to <laughs> that's, yeah, just, that's, that's just the way it is. That's the way it uh, is. Yeah. Now, on a CBC broadcast with host Alan Neal, this is where I talked a little bit earlier about the filming of Jaws. I want to have our viewers uh, listen to this little video here. It, lastly, the chapter on on Jaws that, that starts the book yeah. is is such a classic example of the mistake that happens where, you know, they've done all these tests on a big animatronic shark three different animatronic sharks three. that are, that are going to be used in this film and they get out to shoot jaws and the sharks go in why it turns out they don't work in salt water and they short circuit and you know you have a, a failed a failed jaws we have flaws as as it's put yeah. uh and so as a result spielberg has to write a movie where we don't see the shark for most of it right. and as a result i mean you do end up with a better film. I, 
I yeah. think, than if we'd seen this somewhat fake looking animatronic shark all the way through it. I would be, I would love to read the original script at some point to, yeah. to see how that, how that would have played out because I'm sure as a result, there was richer character development. You're concentrating more on the human characters and, and, and so on. I, I wondered when you were going, when you think of the example of, of Jaws, what, what does it tell you about understanding again, what to do with the mistake, how, how you move on forward creatively in a moment, because again, it's, it, it plays back to that idea of the timeline as well of needing to come up with a solution pretty quickly and deliver a product when a lot of people are, are waiting for you. The pressure you on him in that moment. Creative motion. Yeah. The pressure on Steven Spielberg at that moment, you can't even imagine because he's only 28. This is his first big shot at a major film. So think about this. He's on location with all his crew, with three animatonic sh sh uh, sharks and his cast and, he d and the shark isn't working. Like his whole script is no longer valid. The pressure of that, you can't even imagine. I think that all these different interviews that we've shown today all lead up to a very interesting career that you've had. A very interesting career that I've had that me have changed almost uh, the way that we've done business in, in our career, because one of the things that in another video and one from the last that I'm gonna play is how social media has changed the landscape. And, um, and I know that a lot of younger folks live by social media and myself, not so much. I uh, don't, I watch some of it, but so often you get so much of it that I can't watch it all because it's just somebody showing me what they had for dinner last night or what color they painted their toenails. But let's play this little uh, video here about uh, how you are dealing with uh, social media, talking about it. I think social media has changed everything. That's no secret or no, you know, it's a blinding flash of the obvious, but I think here's what it means to small businesses, which I think is important because nobody ever has the budget they need or the marketing budget they wish they had. Social media allows a company to advertise or to reach customers really without an investment of money, just an investment of time. And I think that's a huge change. I mean, if you went back 15 years, the only way you could advertise was to buy media time, which would eat your budget so quickly. But in this new day and age, you can reach people on mobile phones, which everybody has, everybody's got one in their pocket. You can build your brand, you can share information, you can make use of hashtags to gather a group. And I think there's never been a better time and never been a more powerful uh, medium than social media because it travels. You don't have to be sitting in front of a television. You can send out a message and everybody in this room that follows you can get that message and walk around with it. And I think that is a powerful aspect of social media is that it's, it's actually, it moves, it travels. How do you feel about it? Still feel that way? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I think it's... Uh, to me, they're just more channels, they're more interesting channels, Frank. It's still my bigger idea, my overarching idea is what is the idea you're putting in those channels? Right. But I do think uh, social media has, has changed the, the advertising game 150%. Chris Staples said in one of the interviews that he thinks TikTok is one of the best ways to advertise. Yeah. Um, I guess it is if you're, as you say, if your idea is the right idea, otherwise it's just another way of talking to people without having something of interest in it, you know? Yeah. It has to be an, it still has to be an idea. idea. I think, yeah. I think the mistake people make when they think about social media, Frank, is that you, it has to be created for a short attention span. In other words, or that people's attention spans today are, are like a goldfish, like they're five seconds. And I don't really ever buy into that. I think if you have a great story to tell, people will spend time with you. Like movies are still two hours long, right. the same way they've been since the dawn of movie filmmaking. And I think even within, uh, you know, the 280 character limit of Twitter or the video aspect of Instagram or Facebook, you can still tell long stories. You can put links in those that let that send people to a place where they can feel uh, sit for a longer story. As long as the storytelling is great and surprising and beautifully put together, I think social media doesn't have to be a split second channel. Well, here's a story that I think our viewers are gonna enjoy. It's about something pink. 
but you play that spot. More than two million Canadians have insulated their homes with fiberglass pink. Here's what one particular couple did with the money they saved. We saved enough to buy 252 beautiful pink flamingos. 262, Walter. I stand corrected. Notice that all of their beaks are a beautiful hue of yellow. What you do with the money you save is your business. Our business is making sure you do save money. Fiberglass pink home insulation. Do it for the money you save. Probably could run that spot today. I know. Now, I did not write that spot, Frank. I wrote all the subsequent pink uh, oh. television commercials oh, that came that out was... of that spot. But well, that was a for it. That's, um, that is a great lesson, that particular campaign, because... I got the best brief ever from a client, Frank. He, he came into the boardroom when he wanted the next commercial and said, remember, I sell the most boring product in the world. People buy it once, put it between their walls and never see me again. Make me famous. Yeah, that was his brief good. to us. You got to love that brief, right? Yeah. And by using the, the color pink as the differentiating factor, we did such funny commercials for him, Frank, and they were so loved that he eventually had fiberglass commanded over 70% of the insulation market in Canada because of those commercials, because all insulation was basically the same. If you know what I mean, like it would all worked well, but when you stood in front of a wall of insulation at a, at a home Depot, the pink stuff would jump out at you because those commercials connected with people. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I'd love to have that for our, our advertising business, which makes us stand out different than others, you know? Yeah. Um, one of the questions from the audience was, you've worked with a lot of celebrities. Who's impressed you with their savvy marketing advice or insights? Insights. Anybody? Let me think about that for a second. Um, you know who I loved working with was Bob Newhart. Because he was as nice as you imagine him to be. Because a lot of celebrities, are, you know, they have a persona, but that's not the reality, right? Um but he was as nice as he's as you've seen him on screen over all those decades. He cared about the script. He didn't just come in and deliver the mail. He so what we would do. Our procedure was we would write a, a, like um, five scenarios on a page, just scenarios. Send them down to Bob in L.A. Then he would pick you know three of them that he felt were the best in his character of that one way telephone call that he was so famous for. We would write the scripts, send them back down to Bob. Then Bob would call me at home and we would go over the scripts together and just tweak them to make them, you know, as good as possible for his character. I, don't, I never had another celebrity who went to that extent. Usually you just, you know, you book the celebrity, you send the script. The next thing you know, you're in the studio and you've got, a, you know, 10 minutes to work with them. Bob would call me up and we would spend half an hour on the phone every couple of days working on scripts together. Like he cared. I wonder if he got a little bit of his instinct from the likes of Jack Benny or Johnny Carson. He just had those moments where he didn't have to say anything and he'd laugh, you know? Well, yeah. Writing a, writing a radio script for Bob Newhart is a very difficult task because yeah. even in 60 seconds, Frank, you had to leave him 30 seconds of silence. <laughs> his pauses were everything, right? And you couldn't touch his pauses. So you're really writing 30s that are, you know, once they're assembled are really 60 second commercials. <laughs> well, I want to thank you. And Nabs wants to thank you today for uh, this conversation. I know it's been very, very interesting for me. And there's a lot more questions that I'd love to ask. But uh, I know that uh, in doing so, we'll help uh, raise more money for Nabs. And I want to thank you on behalf of Nabs. And well, thank I you. Really I'm, a big believer. I'm a big believer in Nabs. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Happy to be part of it. Thank you again. It's been a great interview for me, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Frank. Me too. Produced by NABS. <laughs>